team going to Line Fork, Kentucky. Who has never heard of Line Fork, Kentucky? Oh, come on, you have. It's a, it's a place where we've been going and ministering. There's a children's center in Line Fork. It's in Appalachia, if you're from the north, and Appalachia, if you're from the south. And so I call it Appalachia. Um, but we have a team of 16 people, and Cassie is leading our team. So I want all of the Line Fork team to come up, and we are going to pray um, for the team as we go. Now, if you recall, last year we built a distribution center for food, and there's a group from Michigan that comes and brings trailer loads of food down, and it was being stored in the garage, and it was kind of like, uh, Lord, would you raise up a building that we, so there's a beautiful building now with two big garage doors and lots of storage, and people can come and receive food. Sometimes appliances come in, and they give appliances out uh, to the people they need. And so we're going to take the team down, and we're going to get everything ready for the spring because it's still kind of winter down there as we looked and saw. By the way, everybody, just a reminder, it's going to be a little chilly, okay? So make sure you're not bringing your shorts and your sandals. So would you extend your hands towards this team because they are an extension of you, us, and this is how we do it, and this is, we, we send people, we send people across town, we send people to the nations, we send people to places here to serve. Father, I thank you that as we go, that you go before us, you are with us, you are working in us from the youngest to the oldest, and everyone in between and may we hear your voice be transformed, and then may we be your hands and your feet in this whole process, God, and do what we haven't even thought of. Give us ideas, divine appointments for your plans and your purposes to be fulfilled. In Jesus' name, amen. So pray for us as we go and continue on. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Please pray for us, right, Sally? Sally's still smiling after a number of years where we've had some uh, challenging experiences, right, Sally? Here's just a, a real quick, uh, I had Sally on a weed eater, and she had never run a weed eater before. And um, so I gave her this old John Deere weed eater that I refurbished and I fixed up. And <clears throat> it worked great for me because of the way I held my elbow. But apparently Sally, I, I neglected to say, Sally, keep your elbow away from the spark plug, which had no insulator on it. And so this was Sally, you know, mm-hmm. And uh, it, was a, it was an electrifying experience for you, Sally, but you decided to come back the next year. So I was really good. I'm, I'm very glad. So I have some, some really bad news. That's a great way to start a sermon. Do I have your attention? All right. The, the really bad news, before I tell you the bad news, I want to ask you a question. Now, don't shout out the answer, okay? I just want you to answer this question. And I want you to see if you have the answer to this question. Why did Jesus have to come and die? Do you have your answer? Now, I'm going to tell you the really bad news. The really bad news is that sin is a terrible thing. Sin is is horrible. The results of sin are all around us. Seems like we can't go a day without seeing something somewhere in the world where there's been a tragedy as a result of sin. Maybe it's a massacre. Maybe it's a a shooting. Maybe it's 
religious groups fighting each other. Maybe it's an explosion, a terrorist attack. Sin is a terrible thing. Could we agree this morning that that is bad news? Sin enslaves us, destroys us. I was with our, with our city police department this week. And we were talking about Serve the City, which is coming up in June. And we were talking with the officers about the number of people that they are saving with drugs like Narcan and things from from opiate overdoses and phenytal laced drugs. And they're saying it's we, we can't even count them. The number of people that we have saved. I read about it yesterday in the newspaper. A guy who had never had history in doing any kind of drugs. His little dog dies, which was his best friend. And he finds himself in the slide to addiction and distribution. And now he's going to prison. That was right here. Now, here's the thing. Sin is a terrible thing. But I don't want to leave us there. Amen? Because the cross wins. Could we say that together? The cross wins. Oh, say it again. The cross wins. Say it till you believe it. The cross wins. If you walk out of here with one thing today, I want you to walk out of here facing every situation, every news link that you find or see. I want you to say the cross wins. The cross wins. Because today, just like when Jesus rose from that grave, The cross wins. Why was the cross necessary? Because sin is a terrible thing. You see, man is on one side of this chasm. And life is on the other side. Of this chasm. True life. The abundant life. The good life. We're not talking about just breathing. How many of you know that breathing is not life? There's a lot of people who are breathing. That have no life within them. They are shells. They are zombies. They are walk. I think you know. I the, the whole walking dead idea. Is honestly. The way the majority of people. Live their life. Oh, they don't look like that on the outside, but they are that way on the inside. They're going through the motions, but they have no life. So we are on one side. Mankind is on one side of this huge chasm. And life is on the other side. Now, for years and years and years, man has been trying to get to life. They've tried every kind of uh, physical thing that they could do to get there. They've tried to build bridges. They've tried to do whatever they could, but there was only one solution to this terrible sin problem in that chasm. Oh, they would try and run faster and jump higher, but they would always fall short of the other side. They would try and build a bridge, but it would always collapse. And they were down in that place of called, that was called terrible sin. And, and Jesus, when he came and stretched himself out on this cross, he was the bridge between where we lived as humans and the true and abundant life. The only way. Because the cross wins. For those of us that have received Christ as our personal Savior, we have crossed from death into life. I want you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. And I want to explain what Paul wrote in the book of Romans. Now, we read on the reading plan, the E100. Hasn't it? I've really enjoyed 
reading the E100. It's been so good. And this week, a couple days ago, we read Romans chapter 8. Well, that got me on this whole tangent and kind of reworked what I was, where I was going today because I said, Ah, oh, we've got to understand this. If we don't understand where we come from, then the appreciation for the winning cross just isn't there. We think, oh yeah, cross, it's a little thing you wear around your neck. Oh, it's a little icon that's on the front of the church. No big deal. But when we know how bad it is, we appreciate how good the cross is. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the bad news from Romans, from Paul's perspective. And I'm going to read from Romans 7, 21 through 25. Now, if you are, have ever been in a courtroom, how many of you have ever been in a courtroom for any reason? Now, vulnerable moment. How many of you was that courtroom not a great situation? <laughs> because there's a judge at the front for somebody, because somebody's going to jail. Somebody's going to pay. Somebody's got it coming to them. This is the mindset that I want to read this of Romans chapter 7, verse 21. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me. Waging war against the law of my mind. Take your fingers and put it right here. Point right here. And making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. The cross wins. So then, I myself in my mind, point to your mind again. I'm a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Has anyone else ever been conflicted like Paul? Romans 7 is one of those double talk. It's, it's like he, he looks and he says, what I want to do, I don't want to do. What I don't want to do, that I do. That I, you know, he's back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, I'm like, Paul, you're going crazy here. But it's so right. I struggle against the very things. My flesh is built to sin. But my spirit is built to experience the winning purposes of the cross. Because what? God wins. Now I'm going to take you back to Romans chapter 1. How did we get there to 7 before we get to the really good news of chapter 8? And I just want to fill you in very quickly. Let's start in Romans chapter 1, 24 and 25. If you have any questions about some of the things that are going on in our society, I would encourage you to read Romans chapter 1. Where do we stand mor morally as a church, as people, as Christ followers? I'm telling you this, the world wants to take scripture and overlay it with culture or with their way of living. But I, I will tell you this, if we do not reverse that and let scripture overlay culture and let culture's not bad, but we must have scripture overlaying what we think is right or wrong. Man can never determine what God says is right or true. So, Romans 1, 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their heart, to sexual immorality, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised Amen. Later on in that chapter, he talks about people inventing ways to do wrong. 
inventing ways to do wrong. I don't think I, I mean, there's enough ways without inventing ways to do wrong, but uh, it's just they're inventing ways to do wrong. Now, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, remember I'm going to catch you up to chapter 7. Romans 3.23, how many of you had to memorize this when you were in Sunday school, okay? It was, and all, how many people have sinned? How many? All. All but the good people, right? All. Just, just say, just say this. I am all. That's us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Remember the chasm? We're over on this side, this giant chasm in the middle. And what do we do? When we try and get from here to God on this side, to the abundant life on this side, everything that we do, that we do what? Falls short down into the chasm. Romans 6.23. How many of you needed to memorize this one when you were on there? Remember Romans 6.23? Before it goes up on the PowerPoint? What's the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. But, this is the good news, folks. The free gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The cross wins. He stands in the middle and he said, there's good news. This is really bad news, but this is really good news. And I'm going to pour out my blood, my life for you. Okay, now we get to Romans chapter 8. At the end of Romans 7, every single person who started out in Romans 1, we've all messed up. The wages of sin is what? Death. We are all condemned to die. And Paul says, what a wretched man. He's not just saying him as a man. He's saying we are wretched people. You're all condemned just like I am. But then he comes up with some good news. Romans chapter 8, verse 4. I'm going to read it out of a couple of different translations, three different translations. In the NIV it says, In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now take this in context. We are all condemned. The law says what? The wages of sin, all of us, all the time, there isn't one. We are condemned. That's bad news. Oh, but wait. There's more. Jesus, in this place, says, I fulfilled the law. I took your place, and you don't have to go to pay for that. I've already paid for it. You just need to receive the gift. I don't know about you, but that being the really good news, if somebody says, hmm, you know what? I'm going to pay your ticket. I'm like, hello, that's great. Thank you, as opposed to saying, hmm, I don't know about that. I think I want to pay for it myself. That just is foolish to me. But there are plenty of people to do it. Here's what uh, ESV says. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled. Everybody say the word fulfilled. In us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Are you noticing here that part that says we're walking not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. King James says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. There's that word again. In us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Intentional fulfillment. Jesus was slain at the foundation of the world. God knew we were going to mess up. He knew Adam and Eve were going to mess up and set this whole thing in motion long before you and I were ever born, long before Adam and Eve ever messed up and sinned and ate of the tree. It's, oh boy, if we could just go back, right? How many of you think it would be better if we could just go back to the garden and, you know, get a time travel and just say, don't eat of the fruit. Do you think the devil would have stopped with Adam and Eve? Just, just let me tell you. Do you think he would have stopped with Adam and Eve? No. It's just your name would be the one in the book saying, can you believe that it was, you know, put in your name in the blank. And all of the world then is messed up because of you. 
This idea of fulfillment is completion. Now, do you remember, if you've lived here in Chesapeake for a while, do you remember when they were building the Jordan Bridge over, um, the, they were replacing that? I think I have some pictures of it. But there's the, the, the T up there. They put these sections up, and it looked really odd as you were driving past. Do you know that 99% of that bridge could have been connected, built. They were building it from, from different sides. But you could not drive a car across it until it actually connected. And, and the fulfillment is, Jesus didn't come and give some half-baked solution to this horrible sin problem. He didn't come and say, hey, I got most of it, you guys finish. You know, when I walk over that bridge, it's a beautiful, if you've never gone there, park underneath there and walk up over it, you can see all, it seems like you can see all of Tidewater. You can see down to the, uh, what's the, town center. You can see down to town center. You can see all the way over into, it's beautiful. Because somebody completed the bridge. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't say, I got it 99%, you finish the 1%, okay? It's on you. No, because the cross wins. Complete it. There's a bridge that goes across from one side to the other, and we can now get to God. We just receive that bridge. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 8. Now we're going to get down into the nitty-gritty of how we begin To receive what Jesus provided for us. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. I'm not going to ask you how many of you would be embarrassed if what your mind has been set on this week was the next slide on the PowerPoint. Think about it though. Is your mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And the mind governed by the flesh is what? Death. But the mind governed by the Spirit, here's good news, is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor... Can it do so? Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Body, mind, and spirit. We are triune being. Just like you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are, we are made in the image of God. As we look at, at God, the, the cross winning today, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Where is it that you need the cross to win in your body, your mind, or your spirit today? Because that's what he's talking about. He's saying, look, there's all this bad news. I know you guys are condemned. Chapters 1 through 7, you guys are all heading to death. Oh, but now there's good news, okay? The cross wins. God sent it. He he did this from the beginning. But now you have to enact your part to go across the bridge. And this is how you do it. Now, the flesh is the human nature or, or our... Uh, you, th- does the flesh ever, ever scream at you? And, and not just when you're working out and you're like, I'm sore muscles. Like your flesh screams, feed me! My flesh screams, feed me all the time. And I just walk around past food and it's calling out to me like, eat me, eat me, you know? I can't do that anymore. I used to be able to do that. I can't do that anymore. It's so annoying. But the flesh wants what the flesh wants when the flesh wants it, right? Talk about people like, you know, binge watching Netflix or, or whatever. And, and people say, oh, I'm just going to go home and I'm going to flesh out. What, what, really, what does that mean? Like, I'm going to go and indulge my flesh for the. It might not be immoral stuff, it's just letting your flesh guide the ship. And he says, if you're going to live by the flesh, what do you get? Death. Plus high cholesterol and, you know, sedentary life and, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
can't breathe, whatever. This mind, remember I had you point like this? Point your, point your fingers like this again, okay? What's inside of here, the mind part, and it's interesting that Paul uses this particular Greek word only in the book of Romans, four times. And this, this mindset that he's talking about is the inner perspective that determines or regulates your outward behavior. It's a particular word. So if we are going to live by the, the winning way that Christ did when, when God sent Jesus to die on the cross, if we're going to live like that, then we have to think like that. Our mind must determine our actions. So let me ask you that question again. Where has your mind been this week? Where has your mind been? Has your mind been set upon the things of heaven? Or has your mind been set on fulfilling the desires of the flesh? Then he uses another word, which is spirit. Now, the spirit is referring to the Holy Spirit. But our spirit or our breath, what's in us, is the, the, the Old Testament word is the ruach. I like that word. Ruach, the ruach hakodesh. It's a, it just makes you sound like you're smart or something. But um, it's the breath that's within us, the breath of God that comes into us. And when we, when we have the breath of God, and how, many, how many of you would say, I need more of the breath of God in me? Because I know that when I don't have the breath of God in me, my mind isn't where it needs to be. My actions don't follow. I am not the best version of me that I need to be. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 11. We're going to continue this on here. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. Could we just shout amen to that? You see, we can come out of here and we can say, oh, I just feel so awful because I've been living in the flesh all week. And pastor said, if my mind was up there in the PowerPoint, I could, I'm just a horrible person. It's just, it's not even worth living. No, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation, right? To those who are in who? Christ Jesus. And then he says here, you are not of those in the realm of the flesh. Hallelujah. But in the realm of the spirit, you have the capital S breathing breath into you. And if indeed the spirit of God lives in you, anybody that the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit, I love this verse, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in me, giving life, quickening my mortal body. Anybody ever run out of energy? <laughs> the, the, older, the older I get, the more energy I feel like I need. And the more I need to spend time in the presence of the Lord, refreshing that energy so that by his grace, I can go and do what he wants me to do. The more I see when I was younger, I could just go and I could do it and I could kill myself doing it. I could just go harder and sleep less and run harder and I'd be like exhausted and I'm like, ah, ah, ah. and but I would put on the face and let's go again. Can't do that anymore. So now I have to come and I got to sit in the presence of the Lord and Lord, how can I breathe in you today? Because if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, by the way, that's a pretty powerful spirit. You think? that raised Christ from the dead, dwells in me, my mortal body will be quickened. He's not talking about some figurative thing. He's talking about my mortal body being quickened by the very spirit 
that I have chosen to breathe in. Love it. I love it. But, you know, we have to change in order to align ourselves with the intentional fulfillment of the cross. The cross is the way from death to life, whether you receive it or not. Whether your neighbor receives it or not. Whether the hostess at the restaurant receives it or not. Very interesting. I've had a couple of situations at you know restaurants this week, and and it was um, you know one hostess is like is like oh would you please pray you know we just I'd love to receive that prayer. The other one was like yeah I think I'm good. Now, was the resource of heaven any different for either one of them? No, the resource was no different. Was the reception different? Absolutely. The one was in tears. The other one was like, yeah, okay, I think I'll uh, go over there. You need anything? You need your water filled? You know, don't get, don't get too close to those crazy people. Well, Jesus might jump on you. <laughs> Change aligns us with the intentional fulfillment of the cross. How will you and I change to align ourselves with the winning part of the cross? How is your spirit going to be different because Christ won on the cross? How, is your, how are you going to think differently because of what Jesus won on the cross? How are you going to act differently because of what Christ won on the cross? This is what helps me to move from where I am to where I need to go. You see, there's another chasm that is between where we are, or where we are, should say, should keep it consistent, where we are and where we need to be. And that chasm is the cost. What are you willing to pay to go from here to here? We know what Jesus was willing to pay, don't we? His entire life. And we somehow want to take advantage of what Jesus did. Oh, the cross wins. Great, that's wonderful. But we want to stay exactly the same as we are. Living in the flesh, living with our minds somewhere else. And we don't want to pay the price of change. I'm calling you today to pay the price of change so that the cross winning can really be manifest in your life and in my life. What if we all did this? How would we look differently? How would our church look differently? How would our families look different? Lord, we want to be the people that look like what you said here in chapter 8, not the people that are bound up in chapters 1 through 7 of Romans. Can I challenge you today? Number one, to say yes to the cross. It starts by saying yes to the cross. He wins. The cross wins. But will you say yes? Sounds simple, doesn't it? Then secondly, will you allow the Lord to come in and to begin to work right here in your, in your mind, in your thinking? Because that word is out of the seat of your mind, it will affect your actions, which is number three. Will you allow your actions to change? Will you maybe, maybe not go to some of the places, whether literally or virtually, that are being a distraction? Oh, it might not be a, a, a pornographic website, but it might be Pinterest. thousand hours a week on Pinterest. Maybe a little excessive, I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, it's really not that bad. I mean, I'm not that. I mean, it's, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. I mean, I only watched like 77 episodes this week. But I know somebody that watched 150. I mean, come on, you know, let's compare here. I'm not... Where is our mind and then where are our actions? 
I was talking to somebody about a fast that they were doing, and they were fasting uh, social media, and they had their they had a, an app on their phone that tracked where they were spending their time. And when they came down to the fast, and they looked at how many hours they gained in their week, it was like a full work week plus, and that was just on three apps. That was just on three apps. Now, think about this. What if we changed to look like Romans chapter 8? Maybe you need to let the, the cross change you. Maybe it's, maybe it's your spirit's been wounded. And you need your spirit to receive a breath of life. Maybe your mind has accepted things as normal that it shouldn't be accepting as normal. This is one of the things that the, the, the world is so tricky at. Things that used to shock us no longer shock us. We are desensitized in our mind because of... Congen- I found it this week. There was a situation that I was in and I was like, that used to really bother me. It does no longer bother me anymore but I have a sneaking suspicion that it bothers God I have a sneaking suspicion that it's not the best for those involved and then where have my actions compromised where our mind goes our actions follow and could I just call you back to the place where you allow the cross to prevail and your flesh to die and let the cross win. Because the cross always wins if we'll let it. The cross always wins. In just a little bit, we're going to receive communion together and we're going to hold the elements and we're going to partake of them not necessarily together But we're going to allow the Lord to minister to us individually. Right in our seat. But before we do that, I want to pray a prayer and invite you to join me in this. Jesus, thank you for winning on my behalf. Thank you for the cross. I choose to align my life with your way of living. Help me change to be more like you. Think like you. Act like you. I can't win without you. But with you, I can't lose. In Jesus' name. Amen. As the uh, as the elders bring the elements forward, I want you to read this prayer a couple of times, and then I want you to stand, but only stand if you're willing to change. I have a capital word in there, and the word is change. Changing. The way we allow the cross to impact our mind, our spirit, and our body. If you'd like to pray this prayer, I want you to stand and we'll pray it together. And invite that change. You know, there's there's times when we pray prayers that are, give me the want to want to, Lord. I'm not there yet, but I really want to. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for winning on my behalf. Thank you for the cross. I choose to align my life with your way of living. Help me change to be more like you. Think like you. Act like you. I can't win without you. But with you. I can't lose. In Jesus' name, amen. As the elders distribute the elements, I I, I want you to hold the elements, and I'm going to read a scripture. And 
And then I'm going to ask you to bring this to a culmination. So as the, as the, uh, as you're holding this, I'm going to read this scripture two times. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. Paul does, does not tell us how often we're supposed to receive communion. But I was reading this and something stood out to me that I think is appropriate for us today. It says, for whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I was thinking about that. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What did we say in the beginning? The cross what? The cross what? The cross what? What if today as we receive these elements, we proclaim the Lord's winning until he comes? Yeah, I I know this is talking about the second coming and, and that, don't call me a heretic. But what if today we partook these elements when he comes to me personally where where do I need him to renew my mind where do I need him to change my actions where do I need a fresh breath of his spirit in me until he comes we don't want to leave this place saying oh God wins you know cross wins it's great high five and we walk out just as defeated as before we came because the cross does win will we receive the winner until he comes I'm believing and I've been praying all week that this moment the spirit of God the presence of God would come to individuals today meeting you right where he healing you touching your mind renewing you strengthening you that he would do what I couldn't because the cross wins some of you are here today and you feel you're one moment away from quitting you're ready you're defeated you're you're You know what? That's a great place to be if I look at the beginning part of this. Because sin is terrible. It destroys. Boy, that makes life look really, really good, doesn't it? He wants to come. going to worship and whenever he comes maybe he'll come with tears for some of you maybe he'll come in just an overwhelming presence you may feel him my prayer is that You would receive him when he comes and then you would receive the elements.
changing scenes You walk with me through fire And heal my disease I trust in you I trust just came and said I have this sense and this feeling like it's more about the process than it is about the result that should encourage all of us <laughs> because if you're like me I feel like sometimes I'm just in this process I hope I'm making progress I hope I'm going forward but it's a process amen and and Barbara, thank you for that word, because as we move forward, we're not always going to have that linear trajectory where we're always just straight towards the goal and we're finished and all of a sudden we get, you know, the cross wins and now boom, we're like perfect or something. I don't know. It hasn't worked in my life yet. 
But Lord, as we go from this place, would you just cement those words into our hearts that it's you, the God of the process, the one that sent Jesus before the beginning of time to win on the cross so that our body, mind, and spirit might all look like you, act like you, think like you, Jesus. May that God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you walk out of here, look at every situation and say, the cross wins. 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 Proclaim it. Proclaim it. The cross wins. Seems impossible, but the cross wins. Seems improbable, but the cross wins. I love you. The cross wins. 